Siva, are you able to hear us? Am I audible and clear to all of you? Hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Krupp. I'm the moderator for this session. I work for Deutsche Telekom, and I'm really happy to have six distinguished panelists. Uh, we wanted to make this a fishbowl, but of course, as you can see, uh, it's a little bit difficult to set up the fishbowl in here, but we do have a lot of empty seats in the front row. So whenever you feel like doing an intervention, I kindly invite you to take a seat by a microphone and indicate that you want to intervene at any time. Um, we also are live on a platform called Becast. Uh, you can get there through the app or through the web address www.becast.live. Um, I hope we will have that on the screen soon. I think with the QR code that you can see there, it would work, but of course, uh, getting that QR code into your phone might not be the most easiest thing to do right now. Um, are we live with the Bcast? Okay, so we wanted to know to get a first impression of who do we have in the room. We put up a question, what stakeholder group do you belong to? So I suggest while we go to our first speaker for part one, you um, make this information uh, public through Becast if you feel inclined to do so. So we have three parts today. Part one is all about data-enabled digital transformation for small and medium enterprises. Part two will focus on the data flows connecting the SMEs in the global supply chains. 
and part three will dive into questions of privacy and data protection, so regulation basically. Um, for part one, I would like to kick this off with an intervention from Siva Deveridi, who is the founder and CEO of Go Co-op. Uh, unfortunately, Siva was not um, able to join us here, but we have him online. Siva, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Um, very good afternoon uh, to all of you and greetings from India. I am Shiva Devredi, founder of GoCoop. Um, GoCoop is an online marketplace platform for uh, weavers and artisans, uh, predominantly from India. Um, India has the largest number of uh, ethnic artisans. These are uh, craftsmen, these are weavers who make these beautiful products, uh, which are not only well known for their quality, but for their design and uh, you know for the traditions. Uh, not only in India, but uh, but globally. Uh, India has roughly 9 million official number of artisans and uh, unofficially, uh, the reason I say unofficially is because uh, uh, there's a lot of people who practice craft in India as a, as a not as a full-time profession, but as a, as a pastime, as part of the way of life in India. So unofficially, the number could be as, as high as 20 to 25 million artisans in India. And uh, I think uh, most of you must be familiar. I mean, I, I did my schooling in, in US uh, at Arizona State, and then I actually started my career in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Um, and uh, I think most of you are familiar that, you know, there is a huge market for craft products, not only uh, in, in, in US, but in, you know, in most uh, developed economies across the world, and even many developing economies across the world. Uh, the, market size for craft product is estimated to be over 300 billion. Um, and this is growing actually. So the reason why there is, uh, there is a good growth in the craft market according to us is uh, two things. One is there is growth in what we call as ethical consumerism. So people are really concerned and you know, they really care. Uh, consumers are getting concerned and you know, they're quite, uh, um, uh, thoughtful about the products they're buying, what is the impact a particular product is making to the life of the maker who's making these products. And uh, and I think there are a lot of consumers now who are adopting handmade textiles, handmade craft products as part of their lifestyle, as part of their daily living. Um, and at the same time, we're also seeing a lot of uh, growth in travel and tourism across the world. So travel and tourism, again, you know, promotes... Uh, uh, sale of local uh, handicrafts and artisans, uh, um, artisan-based products. So I think the global demand for craft is growing, and uh, that was the idea of Go Co-op. Uh, how can we connect these rural, you know, uh, artisans um, uh, based in India, potentially with uh, with buyers and consumers across the world through an online marketplace platform? That's GoCoop.com. Uh, essentially, we are doing two things in GoCoop. One is we are aggregating these smaller groups of artisans. Uh, it's like an online cooperative where we are bringing together small marginalized communities of artisans, bringing them together because sometimes uh, they are so small and the capacity is so limited that it's not economical to connect them with market. But when we are able to aggregate these groups of artisans uh, and make them into a larger group, it becomes much more easier to connect them with market. So essentially, we are doing two things. The first thing is aggregating artisans. And second is we're connecting them with markets, both in India as well as outside India. So uh, I think the, the important thing is cross-border trade and you know how are we connecting SMEs in global market as part of this session. Uh, so just imagine a scenario where more than... 50% of artisans are illiterate in India. And you have an artisan in a remote part of a state called Orissa, which is fairly, um, I would say the large part of the state is still tribal, uh, fairly unconnected. So in a remote part of Orissa, you have a, a group of artisans who are making these beautiful handmade textiles. And we have a customer in San Francisco who is buying these products 
from this local group of artisans. You know, making that happen, connecting the buyer, connecting this local group, and making the transaction happen through an online platform is what we are talking about. And we've been able to do this very uh, with many customers, many buyers um, from over 12 countries uh, globally. And uh, it's not been easy. I think this has been quite challenging um, in many, at many levels, right? I mean, as you can imagine, right from uh, getting uh, an artisan group online, you know, making them understand what e-commerce is, how it could benefit them, uh, getting the products ready for, for commerce um, in terms of quality, in terms of certain standards, uh, then connecting them with market, you know, the buyers, then finding these products, discovering these products, uh, understanding the products, uh, in many cases also looking at the specifications, what they want, and then finally placing orders. So this is a, it's a fairly complex process, but I think we've been able to do this very successfully across multiple customers across the last five years uh, through the platform. And uh, I think this is the power of technology and this is what I feel is a very good example of what we can do to really enable um, actually sustainable development by connecting these small producers, not only to markets in local countries, but uh, in markets uh, outside their geographies. So that's, this is a, the example of Go Co-op. Um, and I'm happy to, uh, very happy to have this opportunity to discuss Go Co-op with all of you today. Before I go to our second speaker, I would like to have a look at our first Bcast results. So we have an impression of the distribution of stakeholder groups actually participating in this session. So we can see here on the blue bar is civil society currently at 17%, government at 25, private sector at 42, academia 8, technical community also 8. Out of interest, and since we didn't ask that online, who in here is actually representing a small or medium enterprise? Please raise your hand. So they're all online if they're there. There is one. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Um, also speaking in part one is Cornelia Kutter. She's the senior director, EU government affairs at Microsoft. Cornelia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for having me. Um, and. It's, it's interesting you were asking this question. I really like to be following the previous speaker because the, the ability of what he explains is possible with technology um, is precisely where uh, the digital transformation from small, medium-sized enterprises um, is, is uh, such a benefit. Um, and one of the, the big uh, changes has been with uh, the uh, digital transformation, in particular with cloud, where the efficiencies are, are, are high. Um, so um, I wanted to start with a couple of um, notes on research that we conducted uh, in different regions. Um, and then talk a little bit quickly about some of the policies that, that matter in particular, to enable sm small, medium-sized enterprises. I start with a European study that we have conducted in 2017. And for Europe, um, it is accounted that around 99% of European business um, is small and medium-sized enterprises. And they make up around two-thirds of the workforce. So they are a huge economic uh, pillar of uh, Europe's economy. Um, in 2017, we conducted a study with Halt International Business School called In Good Company, a study into SMEs across okay. Europe, and we surveyed around 13,000 small, medium-sized enter enterprises with uh, below 250 employees um, in, in approximately 20 European markets. Um, so the, the, the key figures here is that 40% uh, 
think about digital transformation, the success for SMEs in particular in finding more customers or direct contact with customers. And I think that was something which came through uh, in previous uh, example of obviously m making more money, earning more money, 30, 31% or creating new products and services, 25%. Um, with 24%, they explained helping employees to grow and develop is one of the key factors that makes them uh, look into, um, into uh, digital transformation. We conducted a similar study uh, in October 2018 in Singapore, um, which was called Small and Medium-Sized Enterprises Digital Transformation. Here we also looked into... Um, into uh, the obstacles potentially uh, for small and medium-sized enterprises uh, in, in the digital transformation journey. Um, interestingly, around half of them, 57%, said in the poll that they have not heard about the term, uh, that, that they have heard about the term digital transformation. Um, and, um, then um, there, there, there also, and this is this is almost similar to the study uh, done in Europe the, the previous year. Um, the uh, motivations are fairly similar. So, um, an average of 26% uh, thinks about uh, revenue um, gains, and importantly, 22%. Uh, to seek to achieve an, um, cost savings. Um, the, the, uh, again, also in Singapore, um, small and medium-sized enterprises make up for 99% of all enterprises, hence I think this is a really good idea also to discuss a little bit the issues they are having. Um, they, um, in particular, look at um, efficiencies and attracting new customers, increase workforce and efficiencies and cost savings. So the, the, the motivations are fairly similar. Um, there is a perceived um, concern around, um, around digital transformation, uh, which is around, um, which is about, um, sorry, the um, perceived high costs in the digital transformations, difficulties to integrate. Some still believe that there is no urgency and often the lack of digital skilled workforce is, is also mentioned. Um, I think in particular when we think about as digital transformation becomes a, um, a question about being able to compete in the market, um, the lack of digitally skilled workforce becomes uh, an important uh, area to, to think about in terms of policy. Um, there is new, um, uh, new studies of Forrester, which was just recently published around uh, the big issues around AI in 2020. And they, one of the risks is um, that there might be a new digital divide, those that will have AI-enabled tools and those who won't. And uh, with, in combination with the risk um, of uh, lack of digital skilled workforce, I think there is a certain, in particular, risk of uh, for small, medium-sized enterprises. So uh, with all of that said, um, I'd like to just talk about a couple of um, policies that, that will be important in this context. First of all, and we, we talk about um, data privacy, uh, data protection and security later in part three, but uh, access to data, the ability to share data and open data is I think equally important to consider and enable companies um, to, to have um, the possibility um, to create these data sets necessary to, to, be, um, to be enabled to use and benefit from um, uh, democratized AI tools to, to uh, enable them to compete in, in this new world. With that, I'll, I'll hand over to the moderator.
Excellent. Thank you very much, Cornelia. Um, before I open up the floor, I would like to introduce the rest of our panel today. Starting on my right hand side, hand side we have Malgor Shata Ignatovic. She's an expert at the Office of Electronic Communications in the Republic of Poland. Um, we also have James Howe here. He is a senior advisor at International Trade Center. And to my right is Sheetal Kumar. She is the senior program lead at Global Partners Digital. And to my left is Karsten Kesterman, the principal public um, policy for web services at Amazon for the Central and Northern European region. So, um, if anybody has a question or a intervention to what has just been said by Siva or by Cornelia, please grab a microphone and go ahead. That doesn't seem the case. So I'll go first with asking a question. Um, what obstacles do we see that in particular SMEs are facing when it comes to digital transformation? Please. Could you please state your name and where you're from? <coughs> My name is uh, Wisdom Donko. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of Africa Open Data and Internet Research Foundation. Yes, um, I, I'm going to talk in the context of Africa. Yes, um, the, I think that looking at the topic, uh, cross-border data, uh, connecting SMEs in the global supply chain. Now, uh, Africa has these issues uh, with data. Yes, uh, for Africa to be able to uh, uh, fit in in, the, uh, in this context, uh, the first thing we need to do is to look at our data issues and uh, try to address them. Uh, the awareness is not there, even if you, even at the, at the governmental levels. Now, uh, if you take example, the Ministry of Agri, they have a lot of data. Now, and then those data are sitting there uh, nobody is aware of it. Uh, nobody is using the data, even to even if you talk about let's say market data, for example, which uh, the SMEs uh, can rely on to do their business, whatever business they want to do online and all that. So the first thing is to look at the data issues uh, very well uh, within Africa, and then. Uh, and try to address uh, the data gap. And we also have to encourage uh, the use of data, yes, in, in Africa. And then the lastly, we need to also see how to strengthen the data eco ecosystem uh, within, the, within Africa. And that is the only way I think uh, some of these things uh, can have meaning in Africa. Thank you very much for that statement. Does anybody feel like reacting directly? That doesn't seem to be the case. So I quickly point you to our Bcast application where we have the next question up, which uh, goes to part one and the question we are starting to discuss. In your opinion, what is the greatest challenge SMEs face today in their digital transformation? You have four options to answer on the Bcast app, and we'll go back to that after we have concluded the discussion of part one. So are there any more questions to the panelists or interventions from the floor? The access code to the Bcast is, um, oh, it's a Q. Q <laughs> Do we have a digital for yes, number code? You can put it back up the, the... 
So just to get everybody logged in, um, here we have the QR code. If you go to the website, uh, bcast.live, the session code is ICC Basis Workshop, and that should get you logged in. So you can access this platform on your computer or on your mobile device, and then you're able to submit questions or comments for our speakers um, and also participate in these uh, Q&As. OK, we seem to have people that want to interact through the app now actually on the app. Um, Any questions from the floor? Or statements? Sure. So again, uh, my name is Wisdom. I just want to ask ICC basis, uh, what are they doing in respect to Africa? That is actually a bit difficult since we have nobody from ICC Basis in the capacity to speak to you right now, but I'm sure ICC Basis will be glad to take your question offline. You can visit them at the booth and get the answer uh, offline, if that's okay for you. Cornelia. Maybe I, I'd like to to your first intervention, um, a couple of thoughts. What we, and, and I'm much, much more focused on Europe, so for, forgive me that my knowledge about um, the specifics are not the same, but it, what, what we see when it comes to data governance is, is a very uh, complex set of regulatory frameworks that play together in this space. Um, and and I think there, so it's not only data protection and privacy or competition law, there is public sector information regulation where public sector, for example, is obliged to open up data, sometimes also research that is funded um, by public sources. Uh, and there's increasingly efforts to incentivize data sharing. Um, and so these different mechanisms, they all play into each other and only when you when you analyze them together, I think this will, this will enable a discussion around how to ser serve then, um, in particular, small, medium-sized enterprises. And to a certain extent, there, there is probably not a distinction when it comes to, to the data that is available um, between small, medium-sized enterprises, startups, NGOs, or bigger companies, indeed, to, to, to benefit from, from that for um, new products or, or social uh, enhanced or important aspects of life, such as sustainability or uh, uh, climate research, etc. Thanks, Cornelia. Any other reactions from the panel on that topic? It doesn't seem to be the case. Did I miss someone? No. Okay, let's have a, a look quickly at uh, what our online questionnaire says. We currently have 8% responding, that equals to one response actually. The lack of digital tools for responses go to the shortage of digital capable talent. Another one, threats of cyber attacks, and seven, the lack of awareness and support of the importance of digital transformation. So if there are no other questions or interventions, I would like uh, to move to part two of this session, where we discuss about um, the data flows connecting the SMEs in the global supply chains, and the first panelist that has an initial statement on that is Karsten. 
Yeah, thanks, Thomas. And um, I think, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, my name is Carsten Kestermann. I'm principal public policy for Amazon Web Services, AWS, based here in Berlin, responsible um, for Central Europe. And um, yeah, AWS is, is um, engaging in the, in the sphere of cross-border data flow since its beginning, because of course, the cross-border data flow is a very important topic for our customers who use our cloud infrastructure services. And um, this is especially the case uh, when it comes to um, small, medium-sized businesses who want to um, work abroad or work, um, let's say, on a wider, wider sphere within, within Europe or um, even in the world. And um, what we see very often is that um, at the moment we still lack the possibility or especially small, medium-sized customers still lack the possibility to really um, unleash the potential of um, free cross-border data flow due to the fact that a lot of the um, um, regulations or policies that apply are national and um, that makes it very hard for them to um, apply to those um, to, to, to the variety of national laws and this um, when you think for example about IOT which is which is which is a growing growing aspect especially for small medium-sized companies in the industry and being part of a global supply chain then and you think you think about cross-border data flow then you think about a very metric oriented um, value chain so for example um, let's say the infrastructure that you host your data is based in country x the software that you maybe as a small medium-sized company are developing you you are originated in country b and uh, your customer is in country C, and maybe um, the customer of the customer is in country D. And um, in a non-analog, but in a digital world, that all happens at once, within a second, within a millisecond. And um, um, for the SMEs, this faces a lot of challenges because there's a lot of uncertainty out there of um, what regulation applies at what time and in what circumstances. And so that is true for, that is true for, for, for data privacy, but that is also true and even more true for, for data security um, and for um, sort of um, data ownership type of topics. And um, this, this setup makes it very complex for small, medium-sized businesses to really, as we already um, heard, to unleash the potential um, of a data-driven economy. And, now, and I'm now to only talking about Europe backslash the European Union. Now, now let's, let's give that scope a little bit more complexity and think globally <laughs> Uh, so, so you will you will you will see that um, the setup we face we, we we face today really is not a is not a let's say cross border data flow friendly setup and makes it very hard for small medium sized companies to unleash the potential of data usage or usage of digitization and really add value to to their value chain. And um, this is something that um, we think uh, would be the biggest effect, positive effect, if we could create all together a governance framework that allows cross-border data flow in a very seamless way, especially for startups and small, medium-sized companies that um, erase the uncertainty of what applies at what time, but really gives very clear guidance on um, what type of regulation and what type of policy applies in which sequence of the value chain. 
And um, this is something that uh, we think we all need to work together on it, on a global scale, on a European scale, um, to really help especially small, medium-sized companies to unleash the potential of the digital era and to unleash the potential of the cloud, for example, but not only, but also IoT and Industry 4.0 and e-commerce and, you know, whatever, whatever you can think of, um, of, of, of value chains, because only, only if we make it as easy as a one-stop one shop, one-click type of thing, uh, we, will, we will help small, medium-sized companies to really concentrate on their, on their part of the value chain instead of um, stepping back and, um, and not um, 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 unleash the full potential of, 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 of their business. Thank you. Thank you, Karsten. Before we go to the discussion part, I'd like to pass the floor to James from ITC, who has also prepared a statement for this part of the session. Well, hopefully it's not a statement. I've prepared uh, some notes. Let's see what we can do with the notes. Um, so I'd like to take this a slightly different tack and talk about initially about e-commerce. Uh, which, of course, is not the same thing as data, but e-commerce is very dependent on data. And just a couple of words about positioning that. Uh, e-commerce is becoming very rapidly the new normal in trade. Now, I work for an organization called the International Trade Center, and our job is to uh, encourage development through the use of trade, to put it simply. Um, and I lead a team which is active in developing countries to uh, educate about e-commerce and to help small businesses, groups of small businesses, overcome barriers. And um, so this, this, as I say, is becoming a new form of business. In fact, about a quarter of the world's population, according to Unctad, shopped online uh, in 2017. That leaves the other three quarters, by the way, but it's a growing population, obviously, that's finding what they need online. And the community that we're talking about here is small businesses making use of that. And we've already heard and we heard from Go Co-op at the beginning about what a powerful opportunity this can be. Uh, you, we see in our surveys that small businesses are actively making use of this, that about 82% of firms which do exclusively cross-border trade are small firms. Uh, our study, which we conducted a couple of years ago, um, I say over 1,000 SMEs, over 100 countries, uh, said that 65% uh, of SMEs who were not doing uh, cross-border trade through e-commerce uh, wanted to do so. So anyway, all these facts and different surveys point in the same direction. This is big, this is becoming the new normal, uh, but yet a lot of um, small businesses are held back from doing it, again, which would be a different conversation for another day. Let me tack back now to data, because I've introduced the importance of e-commerce, which for us, uh, is the importance of data and not the other way around. Um, and say, so, you know, data is, of course, its own story. Uh, you know, I make reference to, to a paper by um, McKinsey from 2016 that said in a, the previous 10 years, uh, the d d data growth had been something like 45 times, and they did an, uh, an estimate that the world's GDP was about 10% higher because of those flows of data. So again, positioning statement, this is important, what's going on here. Now, interesting, last week I had the good fortune to attend a, um, a discussion organized by the ICC, uh, a, a, a survey published by the, the British uh, Federation of Small Businesses, which looked in depth at this data question, you know, how important is data and how, how much are small firms being held back by data issues? Um, and actually, Remembering this is a relatively sophisticated market, uh, the majority of goods firms, you know, if I summarize, didn't find that many issues, but 25% of those engaged in service business uh, across border uh, and noted that to have significant issues uh, with data protection or data localization. Um, 
so there was even in even in a market as well informed as the UK, there was a lot of ignorance about data protection and of a small minority of firms that were adequately informed on it. Now let me switch to Africa, which is you know um, perhaps where uh, most of my work takes place, and um, I wanted to look at this question a bit more about data. So I contacted three companies, knowing that I was coming here and interviewed them. And I'll just be very brief, because I've only got about a minute left or so, is um, uh, even here there are issues, even in firms that don't recognize it. So in my area of e-commerce, I heard from, a, I spoke to a gentleman who was in Congo Brazzaville running a site called Le Courtier, uh, who is not untypical of a lot of the small entrepreneurial activity that's going on, sells through Facebook. So you can see that this is very common, it's common in, you know, what, what kind of coaching that we're doing. And there is a question, what are the data issues here, where they're being managed through Facebook? A lot of what, of the agreements that he's having with international customers are being handled through that, that platform. Another, uh, perhaps more sophisticated uh, requirements, a company called Biam Selam, an interesting name, uh, but is setting up um, a, a sales platform which is primarily inbound uh, to um, Equatorial Guinea, but is also covering um, Latin countries, uh, Portugal, Spain, and, and several African countries. It's a startup, but right from the beginning is encountering these issues about data. And there we talked about you know, this, this global issue. And I'm nearly at my end there. Um, making a noise. Um, and we have, we have even more sophisticated firms who, uh, we spoke to a company called Emers, who's based in Kenya and is doing sophisticated data analysis and hosting and managing cross-border activities on, on the part of international clients. So you see there's a wide variety of capabilities and exposure to the issue of, uh, of data. We note that in this last particular case in Kenya, uh, there are new data protection laws which, are, which have come into force in November uh, only a couple of weeks ago, uh, which the company is opposing, uh, what that's going to change for them. So there's a, there's a lot of inquiry, sophisticated markets, less sophisticated markets, uh, what the laws are that govern them, and there is a lot uh, of, of uncertainty at this point in time. Um, I will stop there because that's my five minutes. I can come back to other points as they come. Excellent. Thank you very much for those insights. Um, before I open up the floor for the discussion, I would like to point your attention again to the BCAS platform where we have prepared another interactive element for you to participate in. So, in your opinion, what is the greatest trade barrier for SMEs? That is the question we are asking through the BCAST. The options are market access limitations, different regulations in other countries, customs regulations, language and or cultural gap, lack of online payment solutions, internet connectivity issues, or finding business partners abroad. These questions have actually been asked before, so we're kind of revalidating what this other survey has produced among the audience here. Um, and this is just to give you something to think about while we keep discussing the issue of uh, international data flows. So, anyone feeling like posing a question or making another statement on this topic? Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Lawrence Kay from the Open Data Institute uh, in London. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, put a few, a few points out about the, the nature of data in international trade. So uh, basically, um, if you're an SME or if you're a regulator in the room, then uh, we think that you essentially face questions about uh, three boundaries. So the boundaries between uh, closed and shared data, and then between uh, shared and open data, and then between your sort of national data boundary and your international data boundary. Um, and uh, a lot of uh, the questions that we're uh, talking about are in the shared data space, which is essentially about uh, what are the, the, the mutual rules, regulations, norms, behavior between one jurisdiction and another as to when it comes to sharing data in particular spheres. And um, a lot of discussion um, in fora like these are about, well, should the WTO do something or should the UN do something, um, which is the, the right discussion to have. But there are also lots of emerging policy solutions 
that can really that could really help um, SMEs around the world. Uh, they're things like uh, fintech bridges. Uh, so fintech bridges really is. Um, essentially a, ju a jurisdictional bridge between places like the UK and Australia and Singapore and Canada, uh, which helps SMEs to lower the transaction costs of entering a new market. Um, and these, this type of solution could be spread to uh, other sort of data connection arrangements. Um, there are and also things uh, like uh, data trusts or sandboxes or whatever, where we can really help uh, SMEs uh, from around the world to deal with data issues and share data spaces. Um, and I think that some of the discussion could um, really beneficially get on to, particularly for uh, developing countries, into how we apply those in uh, perhaps some you know, uh, new trade agreements or signal them and then use international regulatory cooperation uh, to really help developing countries enter um, international data exchange. Because, um, and I'll, I'll finish here, so... Uh, what, if you sort of uh, focus the question that was on, on the screen on data, um, the biggest uh, barrier to data flows in trade could be one that isn't here yet, and that's, because, that's if some countries uh, commit to some uh, high-quality data regulation standards domestically, but then are unable to continue with them as, as time goes by and develop a reputation for uh, not being able to commit to uh, the, or implement the standards that they've committed to, that I really, really fear is um, a looming problem that will keep some countries out of international data flows for long, for many years to come, and particularly break their connections with um, consumers in uh, rich countries uh, that need to be able to trust other countries um, in order to be able to share uh, sensitive or perhaps uh, uh, personal data. Um, anyway, so I, that's not a question. Um, I'm not answering any, uh, you know, just uh, giving my opinion, but I hope that's somewhat helpful. Of course. Thank you very much for that. Do we have more opinions or questions? Yes, please. Uh, hello, my name is Agata Freira. I'm a law professor from Morsi University of Technology. And I have a question to Karsten. Uh, you mentioned that we really need a governance framework that allows cross-border data flow. How, how likely do you think that's going to happen, given that all the regulatory f um, landscape is getting more and more complicated and more diversified? as more and more countries introduce their own data protection laws, and some of them introduce um, data localization requirements and other um, this kind of obstacles. So that's the first question. And the second question, in your line of work, given that uh, many of these SMEs struggle really with regulatory issues, um, they do their business nevertheless, uh, what is the predominant approach? Is it they, they find a solution or they just do the business anyway and hope for the best? Yeah, thanks, thanks for the question and, and, and the remark. Um, maybe, maybe to start with, um, it is, I, I didn't say it is not allowed to share cross-border data, I mean, to share data cross-border, of course it is, under certain circumstances, but the, the, let's say, the barrier is not as low as we all wish it would be. So, so it is possible, for sure, um, um, but um, it is not as seamless as, as, as it might, as it should be. Um, regarding your question, <laughs> Unfortunately, my glass ball is a little bit foggy, so, so it is really hard to estimate um, the way forward. Yeah? Um, from a European Union perspective, I mean, the free, we have a free flow of data directive. Um, and, and, and as far as I, um, or as, as, as I listen to the European Commission, they, they do see the importance of the free flow of data within the European Union as something, um, as something, as a prerequisite to, let's say, fulfill the digital single market. Um, I also hear from a lot of national governments, Germany, France, also Poland, that, that the digital single market is something they want to achieve. Um, so, so from a headline base, so to say, um, I think that the, at least the European governments are, are aligned on the goals. 
Um, the question is, so what? <laughs> and the question really then is, okay, quite obviously, um, a lot of small, medium-sized businesses do not perceive the European Union as a harmonized digital single market so far. So um, the question really there is, why? And what are the next steps to overcome that situation? And frankly, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I don't know what's happening. Um, on, the last, on the last point of what are small, medium-sized businesses do at the moment, uh, well, as I said, it is possible to share, especially within the European Union, of course, you can, you can store data abroad, you can share data between Poland and Germany and Denmark and whatsoever. It is just, it's just more complicated. Yeah, and, and I think um, we see that um, example, the fintech example, which is a very interesting one, um, or the financial services example, is that yes, you can share data abroad, but the requirements to, 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 to leverage the data in the financial service sector are, differentiate a lot from country to country. So even if you are sharing data, you need to um, you need to apply to different measure to different mechanisms and different measurements wherever you wherever you um, 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 yeah want to want to use the data and that slows you down in scaling your business of course yeah sorry for not having a more a clearer answer on that one um, but I think last last point and that's a very private observation um, I think the um, the importance to find a solution uh, or the the importance of really making the digital single market in Europe happen um, I think was never so prominent and never so 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 powerful that we see that than, than than now I think before we had a lot of um, discussions about the importance of the digital single market um, and and now really governments feel the the importance of making that happen thank you Karsten that was an excellent bridge actually to part three of what we have planned to discuss here but before we go into the space of privacy and data protection considerations Let's have a quick look at our survey. And interestingly, um, finding business partners abroad doesn't seem to be a problem anymore. That used to be the most popular answer two years ago when this global survey was conducted. As a network operator, I'm also happy to see that we only have one respondee saying that internet connectivity issues are a huge problem. Um, completely fine are the payment solutions and the customs regulation as nobody has identified them as obstacles. However, we do see that different regulations in other countries are the main source of obstacles. Um, okay, so let's keep with the timetable. Yeah. One more intervention on part two. Okay. Hi, uh, I had a small question to Kasten. Uh, my name is Mohammed Atif. I come from India. I'm an ISOC IGF Youth Ambassador. So you mentioned about the Amazon Web Services that are there, which leverage cloud technologies to provide platforms to young uh, entrepreneurs or small and medium enterprises. My question is, is that how do you abreast the owners of SMEs about the digital disruption that the cloud technologies can do? Is there any repository or knowledge platform from the part of Amazon that is trying to, you know, communicate to uh, the SME owners? Because coming from India, I work with the farmers and they don't have the technical know-how about what cloud technology can be. So is it that some companies have a strategic advantage when they have a technical team which understands the cloud methodology and about that? Or is it that Amazon is working in that space to inform 
you know, uh, independent owners or marginalized communities about what technology is about and how they can use it to their advantage. That's my question. Thank you. Yes, thanks for the question. That's 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 a really good question, and and actually, with AWS, um, we um, we are we are totally customer obsessed, of course. So 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 we um, we always try to help our customers to make the most of the, the most usage of the cloud. Yeah, there are there are two. There are two parts of it that one needs to separate a little bit. One is, let's say, the, the technology part. It's like, you know, how to really use the cloud the most secure and best way. And, and we make a lot of, um, we made a lot of um, uh, workshops and engagements with our customers to really help them to understand of how to unleash the potential of cloud infrastructure or platform as a service. Uh, for example, with well-architected workshops through our technicians, etc. PP. That is our. That really is our focus, because um, um, that is also one of the biggest, the biggest, um, yeah, let's say, items or the the biggest challenges, especially small, medium-sized companies face when using the cloud. How to design their architecture right? that it is secure, it is ag agile, and it is, um, it is scalable um, on, our, on our infrastructure. So we focus very much on that one. Um, on the business model side, um, we have a lot of partners who work with our customers to really help them to transform their business model. Because um, AWS is a, is a cloud provider. Um, and I'm not sure if we would be the best consultant or advocate to explain the new business model for digital farming, um, that, for example, or I don't know, fintech or whatever, you know, because that is in the remedy and in the core, actually in the core expertise of the customer. Um, so I'm, we do not, of, of, of course, we, we are, I wouldn't say reluctant, I wouldn't say reluctant, but I would say um, we focus very much on the technical part of unleashing cloud potential instead of the, the business part, because the business part is a decision that should be made and has to be made by each and individual um, 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 company uh, and customer. But of course, what we do is we show the potential of what they can do. You know, like, okay, what really is possible when scaling the cloud with, uh, with customer testimonials, with customer cases, et cetera, PP. So if we have a huge, um, huge um, variety of customer cases, especially for small, medium-sized companies who help them to understand where are the most important points to leverage the potential of the cloud. Hopefully that, understand, that answers your question. Yep, thank you. Excellent. Um, so, before we kick off part three, I would again like to point you to the Bcast app, and I think this time you don't have to answer another multiple choice question, but you have the possibility to do a word cloud. So, while we talk about privacy and data protection considerations, please share your feelings about exactly those regulations through the Bcast app. I'm really curious what's going to be the picture after the next 15 minutes. And with that, I pass the floor to Malgor Szata from the Office of Electronic Communications in Poland. That's right. Thank you for, for this kind introduction and thank you for uh, invitation to take part in this panel, which is very important for me as a person with a background in supporting companies, especially SMEs in, in doing business abroad in scale up and, and so on. Um, so just to start with, uh, from my, my point of view, uh, SMEs and entrepreneurship in general are essential drivers of, of economic and, and uh, social well-being. Uh, they are instrumental uh, to ensure that our economies and our societies as well 
adapt to major transformations such as digitalization, globalization, aging, uh, some environmental challenges, let's say. Uh, however, what is, uh, what is worth to mention, uh, I think and I found that SMEs and entrepreneurship are on, on the high policy agenda in many, many countries, even in, in Poland. The lack of a kind of common sense, a kind of robust and comparable evidence has often limited a more effective policy design and implementa implementation. I found that digital technologies are opening up new opportunities for young companies, for startups, for SMEs, to innovate and to grow, including through digital business platforms, big data and, and fintech. Uh, but SMEs, in my opinion, are much more dependent on, on the business ecosystem and the policy environment than large companies. It's clear uh, from my perspective. Many SMEs continue to face size-related barriers in accessing strategic resources such as uh, knowledge, the right staff, uh, finance and, and skills, digital skills as well. Uh, there, um, while there are clear benefits for, for SMEs in protecting data and mitigating cybersecurity threats, the associated costs are relatively high, I think, uh, and they are higher uh, for, for the SMEs, it's clear. Uh, in my opinion, SMEs are uh, typically less engaged in, in internationalization, going global, just to compare it with the big players, the big ones. This channel for productivity announcement remains a challenge, still remains a challenge for, for small companies, notably in the context of recent trade tensions. I think that it all leads, at the scale of, of the challenges I mentioned, leads and calls for innovative and multi-level policy solutions. And in a few words, I would like to share with you some thoughts and even second thoughts, how we, how we try to make it clear and make it better as the office, as the Office of Electronic Communications based in, in Poland. We try to stay very proactive uh, in all efforts to, to level the playing field for SMEs and, and, and startups. And we try to also capitalize on, on these emerging uh, opportunities, making them a major target of, of public policy attention and support as well. Uh, in practice, we try to facilitate, we try to build a dialogue, we try to build partnerships between all the stakeholders, private ones, public, which is sometimes uneasy as well, the civil society, the tech society, and so on. It leads, in my opinion, to, to better addressing SMEs uh, needs, finally. We also take some steps, even very initial, uh, to strengthen the business support system in Poland. As the office, we, we, a time ago, we launched a kind of project, Better Connected, with its aim to support SMEs and startups, ICT ones, in doing business abroad. I mean in doing business with international bodies, just like UN agencies, World Bank Group, and so on and so far. Uh, we share some information how to do it. We also provide information on markets, on standards, uh, advice on strategies, if necessary. Uh, it leads to, uh, to getting knowledge about access to technology, to, to innovation, and it's uh, frequently coupled with appropriate financing packages. Uh, we also, as the office, try to promote policy coherence at, at national level, at regional one, and finally in the, in the uh, international stage. With our multi-stakeholder approach, it's, it's quite easy. We, we try to cooperate with UN, World Bank, OECD, and so on. Our experts contribute. They are working uh, in the uh, working groups. They uh, take part in many conferences and so on and so far. And we, as the office, contribute as well. We host a lot of, uh, as a Poland, we host a lot of thematic events uh, uh, to, to support the important subjects, also from the SME's perspective. Uh, 
Just to sum up, in, in my opinion, to unleash uh, the potential of SMEs and entre uh, entrepreneurs, on the other hand, it is very important to, to work closely internationally, so the international collaboration is very important. But on the other hand, uh, I think that each country has to find, let's say, its own way uh, to strengthen the legal, the policy, and the institutional frameworks in which SMEs will operate. Thank you. Thank you, Margot Schata. The second uh, input on the part three now comes from Shital from Global, Digital, Global Partners Digital. Sorry. Great. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me at this discussion, which um, I found really interesting so far. I've been taking some notes and hopefully I can respond um, on some of the points that have been made through this intervention. Um, so for those of, those of you who don't know much about Global Partners Digital, we're an organization, a human rights organization based in London, but we work globally to promote a digital environment underpinned by human rights and democratic values. And we work with all stakeholders to that end, civil society, uh, governments, and the private sector. Um, and within the private sector, we work with bigger global companies, but also what we, we term tech SMEs in particular, because as you, as you pointed out already, SMEs occupy a really important role in economy and society. I think there were some statistics earlier and we, and I understand that um, apparently SMEs account for 90% of all businesses in the world um, and contribute up to 45% of total employment. So that's huge. So we understand that importance. Um, and as a human rights organization, um, we believe that having um, respect for, for human rights, in particular privacy and freedom of expression in SME policies is, is a really um, important, but also actually from a commercial point of view, useful thing to do. Um, and any SMEs, we've, I've, I've mentioned tech SMEs, so like startups, for example, that deliver services um, like food delivery apps, you know, um, matchmaking services, whatever it might be. But actually any SMEs in the digital space, um, whatever their operations, designing or delivering services impact human rights. And I think especially for those that start out, uh, what we've found in the delivery of workshops that we've done in this space is that it can be quite a challenge. You're trying as, an, as a startup, for example, to develop a consumer base. You're trying to um, attract investment and maybe human rights and privacy is not the number one thing. Um, on your agenda, and I'll come into why we think it should be. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something that I heard a lot about, which is um, the need to protect free flow of information um, as essential to growth, economic growth. And one thing that's true of data protection frameworks, um, and I'm not going to give you a history of data protection frameworks because there, there is a short one in this um, guide here, which you're very welcome to pick up um, at the end, is the whole point of data protection frameworks is to balance free flow of information for economic and social purposes with uh, protecting the right to privacy. So it's not just protecting the right to privacy. The, the very heart and um, motivation of, of developing data protection frameworks in the first place in the 1970s in, in Europe, in particular now that obviously spread globally, was to ensure that the free flow of information can happen while people's right to privacy is protected. And I think that's essential. Um, it also, they also only implicate personal data, which is not the same as all data. So I think that that's another thing that we, we just need to keep in mind. And of course, now in the digital age, there's so much personal data and there's only going to be more personal data flowing across borders uh, with um, the coming of 5G networks and the internet of things There's just going to be a lot more personal data that needs to be protected. So back to why, from a commercial perspective, um, protecting privacy and, and having data protection um, in place is important. Well, one thing is obviously trust. The second is attracting more opportunities for investment and growth. So on trust, one of the most important things for, for SMEs, particularly the ones we work with, tech SMEs, is ensuring that your client base trusts you with their data. Um, we've seen in, in the past few years an increase in cyber attacks where poor data security measures has led to really embarrassing incidents for companies, exposing large amounts of sensitive data. That's not good for reputation, and therefore it's not good for investment and growth. 
And then obviously there's a point about legal compliance, and we've heard a lot about how confusing um, different regulations in different countries can be. Um, it is really important, um, of course, that SMEs do consider what their legal obligations are. Those are, they might, they will probably exist at the national level through data protection frameworks or privacy regulations um, in, other, in other legislation. But there's also global frameworks, which I can speak a little bit more to. Um, but just on, a, on that point, I think what's really essential is that data privacy is considered and privacy um, as a right is considered at the beginning of designing services um, and the, the platforms or, or whatever might be um, the focus of the SME. Because otherwise you have to deal with that later on. So if you deal with the questions around privacy and data protection when you're designing your product, um, that, that helps further down the line to ensure that you don't come across, um, uh, for example, uh, well, data security breaches or even landing up in court, um, wasting resources, trying to um, f fight back. Um, so, that, so I think that that's one really key, um, one really key principle, data, uh, data privacy by design, that's, that's, that's essential. Um, at the national level, like I mentioned, there are regulatory frameworks. And at the global level, what we've seen, I think there are three main frameworks which are important to mention. There's the Council of Europe Convention 108, which is 55 signatories, um, including non-European countries. Um, and then there's the GDPR, which although it's an EU re regulation, has an extraterritorial um, aspect. Um, not all of the obligations there um, apply to SMEs because some of them don't apply to organizations or companies with less than 250 employees. Um, but the EU has provided um, a lot of guidance in this respect and I think that that's another very important um, piece of regulation to, to consider. And then there's the UN guiding principles, which is underpinned by three pillars, the state duty to protect human rights, the corporate responsibility to protect human rights, and access to remedy for, for victims of business-related abuses, like can be, for example, data security breaches. And that provides a useful framework for understanding what um, the uh, obligations are. But really, uh, to go back, and I know we don't have much time, so I'll wrap up there and hopefully I can respond to questions, I think it's really important not to see um, these regulations and these requirements as a burden because what we've just heard is how important it is to have harmonization of frameworks. What the GDPR has done um, and, and the uh, convention that I've just mentioned and the UNGPs when they're um, uh, contextualized to the national level and implemented is provide that harmonization. So SMEs and other um, companies require clarity in this space. Um, we can't do away with the need, with the need to protect privacy. That's, um, that's not, <laughs> I don't think that's an acceptable um, step to take. So um, ensuring that the, um, that the re regulatory frameworks are harmonized, that more countries adopt data protection frameworks that comply with, uh, for example, the GDPR, is not only useful from a commercial perspective, it will help with compliance. It will remove that need um, to, to adopt, frame, to, um, to try and comply with lots of different frameworks. So the more harmonization, the better. Um, and I think those global frameworks already provide a lot of opportunity for that. Um, so yes, uh, to conclude, I think it's important to see data protection and privacy as an opportunity, opportunity to build trust uh, and a strong reputation, to grow the con uh, your consumer base and attract investment. Um, and in, in having those discussions within SMEs at the beginning um, and ensuring that there is a process for um, streamlining all of, the, all of the data protection and privacy considerations throughout the process really helps in the long term. Um, what we've done at, at, at GPD is develop uh, guides for tech SMEs for nine different countries across the Middle East, Africa, and Latin America which um, explain what freedom of expression and privacy means in legal terms in each of those countries, um, practical ways that SMEs can start respecting those rights, and what businesses can do in specific scenarios, um, like, for example, if a government asks uh, for certain data to be provided on their users. So I'm happy to share more information about those resources, but hopefully that has given you some food for thought. Thank you. 
Thank you, Shita. That was very insightful. I would now like to open up the floor for uh, questions, but also for statements. And what I'm also interested in hearing is oh, how do you feel? Do you feel well protected or do you feel overburdened maybe by privacy and data protection regulation? The floor is open. Everybody overwhelmed. <laughs> Too many regulations. <laughs> sure. See, there's an emerging area as well. I think we've debated um, the kind of first and second degree, which is the movement of data across borders, and we're talking about data security and privacy, which is all very well understood. And I think there's an emerging thing of the value of the data in itself. And what does that mean? Now, there was an interesting debate this morning that, if you weren't there, I recommend getting hold of the summary of it on competition. And in particular, it's raising questions about whether the value is recognized at the origin. So there, there's a certain questions of fairness and whether you believe fairness is important or not. It's certainly an issue uh, that we have to uh, address where value is captured in one place uh, of the activities of uh, the, the data belonging to an origin or generated. So that's above and beyond uh, these issues. And it's certainly emerging, the competition sphere, and indeed uh, the, the SMEs are having to address how do they make money out of data. And these small companies are very often dependent on uh, multinationals who have algorithms and data centers which are far removed. So that's, this is another string to this debate about cross-border data, the value being moved as well as the data. Right. Um, more questions, more statements? This is your opportunity to ask the excellent panelists. Doesn't seem to be the case. Do we want to have a look at our word cloud? Okay. GDPR stands out. Complex and difficult to understand. Difficult to balance open data and privacy. Fragmentation. Fragmented government approaches versus harmonization of frameworks. So, um, James, you seem to have hit it on the head with it is emerging. I mean, the word cloud is a diverse one. And I think uh, we're far from uh, final solutions here. And there's a lot of uh, harmonization and uh, policy development to do. Maybe with this inspirations, we have final statements, questions. If not, I would like to use the Bcast app to um, get support for the summary of the sessions that we do. And I hope uh, we are ready to throw them up there. OK, we need another five minutes. <laughs> so. Um, If the audience doesn't have any questions, I'll see if I can come up. This one? OK. Uh, I have one comment I would like to uh, share with you. However, it uh, concerns the previous part of uh, our discussion. Um, uh, I heard in one of your comments that uh, SMEs don't consider digital single, single market as a, as a uh, harmonized market. and. Uh, I totally agree. However, uh, I work for the Office of Electronic Communication together with Małgorzata, and last year we conducted a study uh, to investigate uh, barriers in uh, uh, international uh, presence of our SMEs. Uh, we see uh, we, we are responsible for regulation of telecommunication market, but we consider telecommunication market as a part of global ICT's ecosystem. Therefore, we pay uh, the attention to SMEs as important part of uh, this ecosystem. And one of important conclusions uh, was that uh, one of the biggest barriers, uh, one of the biggest problem was lack of skills uh, 
allowing uh, Polish SMEs to, um, to develop international presence. Uh, when I say about skills, I mean uh, uh, ability to create international strat strategies, ability uh, to communicate, to, uh, to develop, uh, to target uh, relevant audiences internationally. And uh, it was the biggest problem. While we have uh, some uh, SMEs, uh, that are quite successful internationally uh, and uh, they are data driven. So uh, I would say that uh, the, the conclusion can be that uh, the problem is uh, not with data, but the problem can be also uh, somewhere else. Thank you very much. Do we have more interventions, questions? If not, I suggest we make a last pass through the panelists, and my question to you would not to be sum up the session, please, but if you had a personal wish, what would you wish for the development in the policy space or in the market space uh, in this um, free flow of data SME globalization context? What is your personal take? May I start with you, Margot Schatter? With pleasure. Um, to be frank, I think that on, on the side of the government, there must be a kind of you know, high-level political commitment. It's, it's really necessary to, to change the way bureaucracy functions. And on the other hand, I think that it's a kind of our homework. I mean, a, a need of fundamental rethinking what are SMEs needs, what are policies dedicated to SMEs. We need to rethink it really, to improve the business conditions and finally access to, to resources. Thank you. Thanks. Um, it seems that over the last couple of years, the complexity of these diverse policy elements has just increased, and so it has obviously for SMEs. So my wish list would be that um, there is a realization when uh, policy is made that there is externalities to each of the policy decision that is taken, that these externalities are taken um, more into account and at the same time build the flexibility of the tools and how you can actually address them. So at the end of the day, it's almost like we need to square the circle somehow to get it right, but um, it, having in mind externalities and trade-offs, I think that is, that is very important and, and use technology as a tool to enhance the policies as well. So I think the word complex has been mentioned by, the, my, by my, my two colleagues. I think that's exactly right. I think a number of things are happening at a very large scale, which is causing a lot of change quickly. There are, in fact, three revolutions coming together, which is the digital revolution, which is an environmental revolution and the demands that we have to address sustainability growing. And we have also a kind of social revolution happening with, we, we see it witnessed with populism, but certainly if you like on a global basis, people are posing questions about equity and fairness. And these things will build up speed, I think. And it, this moment of policy, if we bring this back now to data and what's happening with data, it's immensely confusing for policymakers who perhaps get lost in detail very quickly. And I don't think, uh, my wish would be to raise the level of debate there. While it's very important to understand detail and invest in education of policymakers, it's very important to keep a little bit above the detail and I think come back to ask the right questions, which is always a fundamental source of wisdom. And the right questions would be for policy, what is it that we want to achieve? Now those answers to that, and the right questions may not be obvious. For instance, we can say we want to balance a person, the right to personal privacy with a free move, movement of data and encourage trade to happen for many good reasons. But we also have questions that we may not have thought about, about equity of sharing of data and of value and how this happens. 
with the new economics which is happening of, comp of what competition means in the digital era. There are many things that we simply don't know the answers to, but let's pose good questions first of all. That would be my wish. Um, I think my wish would be that, um, as you've said, James, there's a lot happening um, which is going to, f which is fundamentally reshaping um, our society. And um, I think our regulatory frameworks are not necessarily up to scratch. And when the GDPR was adopted, for example, a couple of years ago, it was um, preceded by a lot of concern and, and kind of hype. But really, one could argue it is the absolutely least radical, the absolutely least one can do, um, considering the changes that are happening and the complexity of the issues that we are facing. Um, so we do need to ask, are our frameworks fit for purpose? And we need to have inclusive and open discussions about um, how to ensure that our policies are fit for the challenges we're going to face. And I hope that that will be the nature of the discussion in the future. Thank you. Well, everything has been said by everyone, not just not by everyone. So, so I, I couldn't agree more to, to, to what, what has been raised. Um, from my perspective, I think the most, there, there are two things that I would think are very important regarding cross-border data flow and everything we get discussed today. Number one is, uh, let's look on the bright side of what is possible and, and really have a, have, a, have, a, have a progressive approach, uh, grabbing the chances of, of, of what we can do all together, especially to address the topics that have just been mentioned. Um, and I think um, digitization can be part of the solution and doesn't need to be part of the problem if we do it right. Um, that is number one. And number two, I think, um, which also is linked to that, is that um, let's, let's, let's try to um, calm down the debate a little bit, going back to rational arguments instead of emotional arguments. We see very often, especially in the, in the digital sphere, that a lot of things are let's say, emotionally driven from a, from in the discussion, especially when it comes to security. Very, very interesting, very interesting aspects. Um, and, and, and less, uh, let's say, factual-based discussions. And, and one can either agree or not agree on a, on, a, on a rational argument, for sure. I mean, no doubt about that. But um, um, I think it's very important that, that to really unleash the potential and really, let's say, for example, um, higher secu data security, um, um, we, need to, we need to come back to, to a rational debate and really look into what is the core aspect of what we want to achieve and how we can achieve this on a technical level and not on an emotional level. Thank you. Excellent. With this, we're not at the end of the discussion, but only at the end of this session. I hope we did touch upon some of the right... Siva. Oh, Siva, I forgot you. Many excuses. Go ahead. Your wishes, please. <laughs> a, a few closing points from my side. Uh, so as, as we talked about the different uh, aspects which could be hindering uh, the digital transformation that we are talking about. Um, data could be one of it, but there are major issues around the skills required. Uh, there are issues around uh, policy. Uh, there could be issues around tools and technologies which are available today for SMEs. Uh, but especially when we're talking about connecting SMEs in, in global value chains or supply chains, uh, I see a, a strong need uh, not just in terms of a policy, but in terms of frameworks and tools which can make this happen, especially in the era of e-commerce and, uh, you know, the kind of transformation that, you know, James has been talking about. We are on the cusp of a major transformation digitally, socially, and environmentally. So 
you know, we need to look at frameworks uh, and tools which can really make it easy for small, micro, and even medium enterprises to participate in global value chains and supply chains uh, without the complexity which exists today. I, I hope, you know, ICC and uh, even bodies like International Trade Center, I think should Hopefully, you know, I'm sure they're working on this, but hopefully we need to come up with these tools, hopefully in the next coming years, uh, frameworks which can make this much more easier for smaller organizations to participate in, in global trade. Thank you. Thanks to you, Siva. Um, I'm not trying to summarize this now. Uh, I hope we did address some of the right questions and I'm sure we'll continue this discussion at the next IGF, and I also hope, as Karsten said, that the digitalization is not the problem, but uh, the solution. And having said that, I thank everybody for their active participation and their excellent insights, and uh, be sure we will put up a summary uh, of this session. And uh, yes, that's it for today. I don't want to keep you from lunch. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye.